If you don't know where to start, it can be overwhelming, even paralyzing. So let's fix that. Welcome to Simply Cyber, a community of tens of thousands of aspiring and active cybersecurity professionals focused on networking, knowledge sharing, and professional development. I'm Dr. Gerald Dozier, Chief Content Creator at Simply Cyber, inviting you to get the answers to your cybersecurity problems with hundreds of cybersecurity videos answering your frequently asked questions, interviewing industry experts, and live streaming daily cyber threat briefings hosted by me. Now get the stories and insights you won't find anywhere else. Hit subscribe now and dig into all the fresh content on the channel and in the community. Nothing should stop you from launching and leveling up your cybersecurity career today. All right, everybody, welcome to the show. Today is Friday. Thank goodness. Friday, November 17th, 2023. Holler at you. What's up, Emmanuel? Guys, welcome to episode number 497 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Gerald Ozier. And over the next 45 minutes, me, you, Alpha Sierra, Christopher Young, Catchy PT, meet in. Folks like Raymond Cruz over on LinkedIn and Izan Ondetti, Marcus Kyler with the Yeet, C. Bright, Eugene, Priceless Pancake, regulars like Christopher Young, Terrence Billingsley, Luke Canfield, Cat GPT, maybe some first timers in here who I have yet to meet. We're all going to be treading the top cybersecurity news stories of the day, and I'll be giving my expert opinion and analysis on each of those stories on what it means to you as a practitioner. So how can you use this to drive cyber risk reduction? For your organization today, tomorrow, next quarter, whatever, you need to stay current in order to be able to get on top of the things that you need to manage and defend. Cybersecurity, y'all, it's really called cyber resiliency, and it's all about knowing what levers to pull and where to commit resources when. And guess what? Knowledge is power, and that's what we're delivering in this stream, this podcast, every single morning. Straight up, un fettered power into knowledge all right and if you're looking to break into the industry don't think that you're not welcome here you're going to be asked in <clears throat> any single job interview how do you stay current in the industry believe me the simply cyber daily cyber threat briefing podcast is a banger of an answer i'm talking borderline fist bump across the table from the interviewer when they're like oh yeah you're in the know listen you're going to get understanding of current concepts, current terminology, and the networking over here. Look at all these people, man. We're talking hundreds of practitioners, sharing, supporting, inclusion, tips, tricks, what certs. I'm telling you, the networking, it's a chef's kiss. Believe that. But before we get into the show, before we shred the face of the cyber news, let me give a shout out and thanks to the stream sponsor. Start with my good friend, Eric Taylor and Barricade Cyber Solutions. Yo, Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated. Get out of here, pop up. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. But guess what, Chris Shirk? Guess what, Jenny Housley? I'll tell you what. Barricade Cyber Solutions knows how to mitigate the damage done. They can straight up yeet. The threat actors out the environment, they can help mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. Believe that. Keep them on speed dial at a minimum. BarricadeCyber.com. Links in the description below. What's up, Kingsley Scott over on LinkedIn? Good to see you this morning. Hey, what's up? Did you guys know about Panopsi Security? I do. I'm a board advisory member there, and I am happy to share that you can find out about how they can partner with your organization to drive cyber risk reduction. But Jerry, that's a bunch of buzzwords and flim flam. A lot of fluff coming out of you. A lot of hot air, bro. What are we talking about? All right, brass tacks. Panopsi Security has a lot of industry experience. So what you can do with them is say, hey, we're doing an okay job here, but we want to do a great job here. Panopsi, can you help us? Yeah, sure, no problem. They swoop in. They're like... Uh, basically uh, fractional info information security practitioners, and really with a focus on enterprise risk assessments, quantified risk assessments, fair methodologies, they, tabletop exercises, they can come in and basically bolster and help scaffold your information security program with knowledge, guidance, uh, roadmaps. And I'm telling you guys, 
Yes, it's cool to drop new tech into the environment. Shiny objects, installing a, a blade into the server rack. Ooh, sexy. We're, we're running wires up in here. Sometimes the, the Cat5 cables are a little bit longer uh, than other times, depending on who's installing them. That's an inside joke where I use like a 75-foot cable to go about six inches. But it's not all about tech. Guys, you need a strategy. Like, what tech are you buying? What order are you putting it in place? Who the hell is going to... Sorry, Kenneth. Who the heck is going to manage the tech? What's the life cycle plan? Are you going to deprecate old tech? These are all real questions that you should think through before you spend a single penny. Panopsi Security, they can help you. Go to panopsi.com. Links in the description below. Ask for Brandon Poole. Tell him Jerry sent you. Now, listen, anti-siphon training, another chef's kiss. And guys, stick around for jaw jacking because I have an amazing thing to share with you that I got an email about 1030 last night. And I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Like like borderline if Jen Easterly had emailed me um, this this level of fanboy is. So ask me what I flipped out about um, on uh, email last night. And I'm, I'm pumped to share it with you. OK, now check it out. We're going to get to anti-siphon at the end uh, at the mid roll. Excuse me. But did you know, did you know, Bobon, did you know, Billy DP, that each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing, just like this one, is worth half the CPE? That's right. They stack two and a half a week, 10 a month. So say what's up in chat. Hashtag Team Live if you're live with us. Hashtag Team Replay if you're on replay. All episodes of the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing uh, are left online. And they're um, accessible, so you can go back and audit it if you want. But what I would say is take a screenshot, file it away, get those CPEs. Get them. Nom, 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 Eat those CPEs, right? Holla. All right, now check it out. Hashtag Team Live, hashtag Team Replay. But what? let me tell you this. If this is your first episode, first of all, happy Friday. Second of all, welcome to the party, pal. If it's your first episode on the stream... I'm talking to you, first-timer. Drop a hashtag first-timer in chat. Don't be shy. If you comment one thing on this stream, make it hashtag first-timer. Believe me, we love welcoming our newcomers. A very supportive, inclusive community. We will widen the circle in a hot minute for a newcomer. So let us know if it's your first episode. And if you're a regular, shout out and holla. Good to see you. Hold on, hold on. There we go. All right, guys, I do not prep, prepare, or research any of the stories. In fact, I was in such a hot a hot mess express this morning because I had to update one of my applications. I literally don't even know what the titles were. I was just like, click, 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 click. So we're all going to figure it out together. Whoa, Soul Reaper. Hello. Tracy TLC. Hello. Welcome to the party, pal. Let, let's get these out. Let's get these here. Boom, 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 boom. Soul Reaper, Tracy, welcome to the party, pal. Welcome to the party, pal. That's what we do. All right, y'all, sit back. Tracy, Soul Reaper, sit back, relax. Let's get to work, and we'll see you at the mid-roll. We're going to let the cool sounds of the hot news wash over us in an awesome wave. I will see you, Logos, at the mid-roll. It's cybersecurity. Welcome to the party, pal. These are the cybersecurity headlines for Friday, November 17th, 2023. I'm Steve Prentice. Fortinet warns of critical command injection bug in 40 sim. This All is right, a- hold on. Priceless Pancake dropping a super chat. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Priceless Pancake can't express how much this podcast has helped me in just four months. If you are new, sub. It will change your work life. Thank you, uh, Priceless Pancake, first of all. Second of all, to Priceless Pancake's point. Welcome to the party, pal. Hit the sub, bell for notification, all the YouTube things. You've seen a million videos tell you what to do. You know what's up. If you want more of this, settle in. We got a whole train full of this stuff coming at you. Vulnerability that could allow unauthenticated executions through API requests. It is being tracked as CVE 2023-36553 with a CVSS score of 9.3, although NIST is giving it a severity score of 9.8. Fortinet researchers confirm that this vulnerability is a variant of CVE 2023-34992 that was fixed in early October. Quote, affected versions include Fortisim releases from 4.7 through to 5.4. 
Fortinet urges system administrators to upgrade to versions in the 6 and 7 series, the full collection available through a bleeping computer in the show notes to this episode. All right. <clears throat> okay, so a couple things coming in hot here, okay? Um, I mean, it, it's so funny because there really is a lot to pick apart at this story. So first of all, Fortinet, I would consider them like a tier two um, network you know, device manufacturer. Okay. Like Palo Alto, Cisco's tier one. Fortinet is not as ridiculous as like QNAP or, um, Zixel and, uh, you know, these other kind of like, <laughs> uh, products, but Fortinet's you'll see Fortinet in businesses, but Fortinet gets, uh, a lot of issues. Now here is a bunch of things that you should know. First of all, if you're running Fortinet for the seam in your environment, you should absolutely got to patch this. Okay. Ah! You gotta patch it. Now, second thing, I don't think a Fortis seam would be internet facing. Okay. So to me, it's an it's the vulnerability level. Um, well, hold on. Let me let me back up. But you should patch this, but most often your Fortis seam, like a sim shouldn't be internet facing. That's ridiculous. Like if your sim is internet facing, you have, I'm sorry, my friend, but you have bigger architectural problems going on at your business. So you shouldn't like smash the shut it down button and like, you know, stop the entire job work site until this gets fixed. But you do need to get this fixed. They said um, Fortinet says it's a 9.3. So let's talk about CVSS scoring. CVSS is common vulnerability scoring system. It's basically the way that me and Divine Dream Divine and Eric Rim and Marcus Kyler can talk about a vulnerability and how bad it is, right? It, it, it's a score that allows us, but you've got to remember when you're talking about the score of a, of a vulnerability, it does not account for your environment, right? So like B sex environment is way different than uh, my environment is way different than hemoglobin's environment. Right. And then, so, so like you can't say like to me, a four to sim internet facing and one that's in a lab are way, way different uh, vulnerabilities of likelihood and impact, frankly, to the organization. Shout out to my GRC people who know what's up. So you have to be mindful of this kind of environmental variable as well as a temporal variable, meaning that uh, normally the temporal variable never gets less. It only gets worse. And that's because uh, exploitation starts happening, proof of concept gets published, and then uh, a Metasploit uh, plugin gets made, and then it's it's the worst. Now, what's interesting is this particular story, the vendor itself declared it a 9.3 vulnerability, and then NIST came out and said it's a 9.8. Couple things to note here. One, obviously, <laughs> the vendor wants a lower vulnerability. They do want to be somewhat... Um, diplomatic and practical about calculating because there is a there is a formula for how you calculate a CVSS score. It's not like you just reach in your butt and pull out a number and be like, here it is. So, but you can, you know, be liberal with certain things and conservative with others. So Fortinet says 9.3, NIST says 9.8. Um, here is the reality. If it is unauthenticated, remote code execution, that's 9.8 all day long. The only time it's not 9.8 is if it's being actively exploited and then it's a 10. You don't get like if remote code execution unauthenticated. It's a 9.8 or it's a 10, like full stop. All right. So Fortinet, you're being cute. But at the end of the day, a 9.3, a 9.8, it's still. Um, can I get the emote uh, squad members, please? <laughs> of the dumpster on fire. It's straight up a dumpster fire. OK, uh, hold on. I, I've got to pull it up myself here. Where There it is. All right, dude, nine three nine eight ten zero. It, 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 you're it's trash. Okay, like you've got you've got to get it fixed. Okay. Now the final final thing I'll say about this is um, the way that this and this to me this is a little bit of people who have been in the industry for a while are going to um like you know nod and not speak like they're just like solemnly looking across the fire and just like mm hmm. And then people who are new to the industry, you should holler at this. This is an OS command injection through an API call, an application programming interface. So you make you make a custom call to an API into the FortiSim, and it will push it down from the application layer down into the operating system. Remember, FortiSim, 
or whatever, it doesn't matter. Any piece of software runs on a system that's running an operating system. And I don't care if it's a, a network device that's running some flavor of Linux, right? If it's, if it's a file server, it's running some flavor typically of uh, Windows operating system. But there's always an operating system underneath. Like there's no software application package that's directly accessing the kernel and doing like hardware allocation that you need an operating system. So with this bug, you can do straight up OS commands, which is terrible. And the first thing I thought of when I saw this, and this is where the people are going to be like, mm -hmm, Jerry, back in the day, SQL Server, which was like all the rage for a minute, SQL Server, you used to be able to use the SA user account and use the, I think it was XP underscore command function and i know i'm getting wicked specific here but like you could literally just call windows server operating system commands directly through sql server it was like the biggest gap it was i mean to say it was exploitable it was is ridiculous i mean it, it was like a feature not even a bug uh and you know basically threat actors it got all up on it it's like i wish you could see the lower half of me but like uh it's like i'm putting on uh like sql server SA admin pants, and I'm like walking around like a threat actor, just executing operating system commands. That's what's up. And this reminds me of that. I don't know if anyone else agrees in chat, but this to me, straight up SQL Server SA running XP command uh, operating system shells. It's the same. It's the same thing, except this is um, uh, you know trashy for that. Another data breach for Samsung. Discovered this past Monday, this breach affects customers who shopped at the company's British online store between July 1st, 2019 and June 30th, 2020. According to Security Affairs, threat actors exploited a vulnerability in an unnamed third-party application. Samsung is informing affected customers that the stolen data may include names, phone numbers, postal and email addresses, but not financial information. The company also reiterates that U.S. customers were not affected. <laughs> uh, the company reiterated that their largest po buyer population was not impacted. I hate to be so cynical, but... Great cash, homie. All right, so Samsung gets punched in the mouth. It looks like it's in their uh, European office or space. Uh, GDPR is obviously going to make sure that they need to disclose all this. Uh, the vulnerability was in a third-party business app that they use. Welcome to 2023, Samsung, where everybody uses SaaS applications to speed up the speed of business for their uh, company. Uh, but dude, this is third-party risk management. Somebody call Neil Bridges and let him know that third-party risk management really is a thing in 2023. Samsung has to take the heat for this. Samsung's you know, the one who gets brought out in front of everybody. And in reality, it's some third party that they teamed with. I'm sure the third party is is like, ah, oh, we're probably going to lose that huge Samsung contract now, aren't we? Ooh, not good. Okay. It doesn't go into the details of how the data was exposed, but really at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter um, unless it was like multi-factor and then I can have a little uh, meltdown. Fashy! But you know what I'm saying? Oh, was this three years after the fact too? I didn't even see that. Oh yeah. Look at that. Good call. L. Scott Munez. Yeah. Hey, uh, 2019 called pre COVID called. They said you had a data breach. Like, woo, we like, okay. There we go. Oh, hey, by the way, uh, this was actually um, not a third party that was doing data handling. This was just a third party that had developed some software that they were using. Again, I mean, it's we're splitting hairs at this point, but name, phone number, postal email. It, this is inputs into a social engineering attack. In 2023, most people should be, uh, you know, Mindful of being socially engineered, mindful of phishing emails, mindful of BS coming in. Uh, that's what this is. And can I just really, really point out wicked fast that um, in 2014 or whatever, Target had a similar breach. Now, the Target breach had credit card data, but like literally, literally, the 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 community, the public, everybody was on fire. They're like, oh my God, this Target data breach. Oh. Ah, like you know like let's let's shut it all down like this is this the end is nigh there's like people walking around with the cardboard signs wearing just like a trench coat and they're just like ah and and now 2023 this isn't even a lead story this is just like ah, samsung huge breach did you see the new tiktok you know what i mean it's like it's crazy how we've become desensitized and normalized to these things 
James McQuiggan coming in with a dad joke a little early. What did the big flower say to the little flower? What's up, bud? <laughs> Thanks for the super chat. Yep. Ricida warning from FBI and CISA. The two agencies issued a joint cybersecurity advisory to warn specifically about the group Ricida and its ransomware attacks against organizations in multiple industry sectors. The advisory states in part, quote, threat actors leveraging RICEDA ransomware are known to impact targets of opportunity, including victims in the education, healthcare, manufacturing, information technology, and government sectors. Open source reporting details similarities between vice society activity and the actors observed deploying RICEDA ransomware, end quote. This group is known for using living-off-the-land techniques, such as native network administration tools, to carry out its attacks. All right. This is your, um, the, the, the Ricida, by the way, I, I say uh, Ricida, like Jack Ricida <laughs> from Darknet Diaries. I wonder what he thinks about this. But anyways, um, the Ricida ransomware gang, dude, they are basically... Um, they are based. So here's the deal. We talk about different threat actors and, and, and when I talk about them, I talk about their level of sophistication, right? So some threat actors like, uh, Alfie and Lockbit, um, they are, they're basically like really well-oiled, uh, criminal enterprises, right? Like, like fortune 50 companies. Okay. Um, they probably do performance review. It's Friday, so maybe they have like you know happy hour Friday at four o'clock in their in their you know dungeon lair where they hang out and do their criminal activities. Um, makes me think of like the the Brotherhood gang of assassins in Skyrim. Really weird uh, deep cut there, but um, I'm just thinking that's where like the threat actors hang out. Sorry. Anyways, the the this particular cyber criminal gang to me. Um, epitomizes and captures exactly what we should be worried about. They are a threat actor gang of opportunity. They typically leverage external facing remote access capabilities. So what are they doing? They straight up use Shodan or their own scanning tools to search the internet IP range and find listening services on port 3389, on port 9901 or 9001, right? What's VNC? I think VNC is 9001 by default. Anyways, the point is they search for these things and then they try, you know, bad passwords and stupid accounts. And you know what? Play stupid games, win stupid prizes, as Mrs. Ozier likes to say. So this th these guys, they're all about low-hanging fruit. They don't care if you're a manufacturing company, a healthcare company, a small business, a nonprofit. They could give AF. All they want to do is straight up smack and slam, hit, and, you know, uh, eventually, you know, you'll hit pay dirt over and over and over again. Yes, they've released TTPs and IOCs, uh, tactics, techniques, and pro procedures. I always get TTPs wrong, but basically the way the threat actors operate, what kind of ways they get persistence, what kind of C2 they use, how do they initially infect their victims, right? All those things you can get from MITRE ATT&CK. Then there's IOCs, if you, indicators of compromise. If you've been compromised by Recida, uh, chances are you're going to find out because they're going to drop ransomware on you, which is basically tells you that you're infected. But maybe they're playing it low and slow. They're simmering, trying to wait until they can get more hosts infected. So you have a small window where you can identify if you've been compromised, right? So this is called threat hunting. If your tooling hasn't detected that you've been compromised, then using the IOCs to go look if you've been compromised is called threat hunting. Threat hunting isn't some advanced skill. Anyone can do threat hunting. Drop the IOCs in your SIM or you know in into um, Office 365 or wherever you're going to go look and see if this crap shows up. TLDR, you should not be hide. You should not be defending from Recida ransomware or Lockbit or Royal or Vice. You should be protecting from ransomware in general and recovering from ransomware attacks, tabletop exercises, immutable backups, um, work through what the process looks like for what uh, applications, workflows, people, you need to stand things up. You know what? Hey, I know it's really, um, I know it's really uh, bad to only have two people in IT understand how the backups work, but guess what? If that's your current situation, I'm sorry, but 
You both cannot go on vacation at the same time. Now, listen to me, Jack and John, or Jack and Jill. Jack and Jill are our two senior you know, IT people, and they're the only ones who know how the backups really work, right? Like everybody knows how to restore from backups, but do you know how to restore backups from this for this business? If it's Jack and Jill only, here's what I would tell you. One, you both can't go on vacation at the same time. We need one of you here at all times. And if that's a problem for you, then document how to do the backup procedure or train the other analysts on the team or do something to free yourself up. Otherwise, you're both not allowed on the same plane. You're both not allowed to go on vacation at the same time. We need that here because it's part of our business continuity plan. And if you don't have that knowledge or that capability in-house, and when I say in-house, I mean readily accessible. If you were to get hit with ransomware today, right now, then you're taking on unbelievable risk for no value. Do you understand what I'm saying? If Jack and Jill go away for Thanksgiving, which they should be entitled to, but say they're married and they leave today and they're going to, you know, whatever, Bali, and they're on a plane or whatever, and you get hit with ransomware at three o'clock, which by the way, threat actors love Friday afternoons for ransomware. What are you going to do? What are you going to, you're, you're just going to wait. Okay. Like nine days until they get back from vacation. No, that's stupid. And you know, it's stupid. So, so you, you're, you're taking on additional cyber risk for no additional value. Do, do you see what I'm saying? From, from a GRC perspective, holla GRC, like you, you have to have a trade-off. There has to be value added for you to take on additional risk. If you're just taking on additional risk because it's the kind thing to do, well, then what are you doing, my friend? All right. These are the hard conversations you got to have. Okay. Coker nomination as cyber director advances to the Senate. The Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee has advanced the nomination of Harry Coker as White House National Cyber Director. This nomination now goes to the Senate floor. According to the record, quote, Coker is a career naval officer who served as executive director of the National Security Agency until 2019 and has since worked for a series of technology startups. He is slated to take over for Kemba Walden, who stepped into the role after the first cyber director, Chris Inglis, resigned earlier this year, end quote. Oh, my God. OK, so a couple couple things here. One, and you guys are going to find out I've got another like uh, I don't want to call it like a crush, but like I've got another fanboy thing coming up here in a hot minute. All right. Harry Coker. I've never heard of this guy, but he was executive director of the NSA. He went and heart helped a bunch of tech startups. The dude, I, I don't know him from a hole in the wall, but I bet you he's really, really good at his job and super knowledgeable and probably really well connected in DC. That's another thing, guys. By the way, you can be like the bee's knees. You can be like a freaking you know textbook of information security knowledge. But networking, I say it all the time. Networking is so valuable. And you know, this guy right here, like he's probably well connected in DC. Do you know how you get things done? By having people you can call to get things done. It's called back channeling, side channeling. You know, like, it, I'm not saying it's illegal. I'm just saying like, oh, you got to go up and down the chain. You got to spend time going up and down the chain. When I could just call you and be like, listen, we want to get this thing done. What are your thoughts? I think it's a good idea. All right, I'm going to push the paperwork through tomorrow, but let's get this rolling today. This is a major issue. Done, done, <laughs> right? That's how crap gets done. So having the network being able to technically do the job is important, but there's a lot of people who can do that job. Having the connections is important. Now, the other thing I want to say, and allow me to fanboy out for a second, I do find it, um, uh, they mentioned Kemba Walden, um, who uh, who took over for Chris Inglis uh, as the NSA director there. Now, there this came out recently uh, that the White House was criticized for not tapping Kemba Walden. I do not know why they didn't. This woman is freaking amazing. I I love this. I, okay, I, love is a strong word. I really appreciate this woman's capabilities, work ethic, thought process, the way she speaks. She is, for all intents and purposes, cut from the same um, what, bolt of cloth as Jen Easterly. If you get a chance, Google Kemba Walden. It, like watch her speak. She is, she is, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's too bad. She didn't get the job as NSA, um, director. And, and you know what? 
I, I get it. I get it. She, um, like, I, I don't get why they didn't pick her, but I get why she's like stepping aside now, right? Like, I, I've got passed over for, um, in a really, really effed up story, I got passed over for a CISO job that I was basically doing. And uh, and I got passed over in a way that really pissed me off. And I quit. Like, I quit immediately. Um, and, uh, well, not immediately. I, I did the right thing, which uh, some people would criticize why, you know, doing the right thing or not. But anyways, um, but I quit, right? So this woman, she's awesome. She gets passed over. You think she's going to uh, stick around and be like, oh, let me just take it on the chin and then hang out? No. Here's here is Kemba Walden talking at DEFCON 31. Power to the people, right? Getting right into the trenches with the DEFCON crowd. Fireside chat, national cyber director. Check her out, dude. I'm telling you, if you don't know Kemba Walden, um, she she's right up there with um with with Jen Easterly in my book, okay? And now a word from our sponsor, Sysdig. For businesses innovating in the cloud, every second counts. Sysdig strengthens cybersecurity by reducing the attack surface, detecting threats in real time, and accelerating incident response. The platform correlates signals across cloud workloads, identities, and services to enable businesses to prioritize risks and act decisively. Sysdig. Secure every second. Big names discuss... Hold, hold on. I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm... Uh, we're going to get to this in a minute. I'm just, I'm, I'm mod chatting here. All right, guys, it's the mid roll, which if you're new here, first timers, um, like Soul Reaper and uh, Tracy. Hey, 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 you will never hear this song and not think of Simply Cyber. Believe that. Guys, check it out. Well, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here so much. Having a great show. Um, James, well, hold on. First of all, if you're getting value from the show, whether it's uh, educational value, entertainment value, networking value, whatever, if you're part of the community, hit the like button. It goes a long way to help trigger the YouTube algorithm to help other people who, who are into cybersecurity find the podcast. That's basically what we do every day. And uh, I genuinely appreciate y'all taking the minute to hit the button. And for those who are first timers here, it may be because of this uh yesterday okay now i want to thank the stream sponsors barricade cyber panopsi and anti-siphon training guys anti-siphon training is disrupting this traditional cybersecurity training industry for you 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 and you by providing high quality cutting edge valuable education with hands-on training by instructors who are practitioners of the senior level with regardless of your financial position. Now, they have tons and tons of training, but a subset of their training, if you use the link in the description below, or you just Google it, is pay what you can training. Go to training, go to pay what you can. The pay what you can training is exactly what it sounds like. For zero dollars, you can take this training, and I want to call your attention to an upcoming um, training in January and February by the very own John Strand, Ape Lincoln, Kimberly Can Fix It Know What's Up. John Strand, legend in the industry, he will be teaching active defense and cyber deception, which I have taken and I loved that class, as well as SOC core skills with John Strand. 16 hours, zero dollars. Don't sleep on this. Christopher Young, for example, if you're new and you're trying to get exposure, trying to get knowledge, trying to baseline yourself, and you don't want to pay an arm and a leg, this is your calling. Use the link in the description below. Check it out. I love anti-siphon training. I love John Strand. I love Black Hills Information Security. I love Jason Blanchard. I love Deb Wigley. I love Velda Lemke. I could go on, but believe me, I love what they're doing for our industry. Absolutely sensational. Thank you all so very much. Now, guys, let's talk about the Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Um, Where's Jenny? Uh, John Hoyt, my man, Clemson's own CISO. John Hoyt currently has the baton. Um, the Simply Cyber Community Challenge is an opportunity for you to network like a boss. If you want to spend five minutes a day, if you have five minutes that you can invest into professionally developing your network, listen up. If you don't have five minutes, I suggest you find five minutes because the value on return on your time investment is un unbelievable. 
go online and search for this. Ha- go on LinkedIn and search for this hashtag. Hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Connect with the people posting like John Hoyt did yesterday. Connect with the people commenting and comment on the posts. Find the hashtag, connect with the people posting, comment, connect with the commenters. You will get picked up in the slipstream and everybody that comes after you that connects with the commenters will connect with you. So you're going to get connections with the poster and the commenter. So there, there's like 10, 20 people right there. Then everybody that comes after is going to connect with you. Just say in the connection thing, hey, Simply Cyber or Community Challenge, whatever. Within two weeks time, five minutes a day, two weeks time, your network will be in the hundreds at least of like-minded, cybersecurity supportive, inclusive, well-intended, righteous professionals who can help each other. And your LinkedIn feed is gonna be sick. It's gonna be straight up dope. You're gonna love it. Take five minutes, Simply Cyber Community Challenge. John Hoyt, please tag somebody in chat in order to get it going. Uh, John Hoyt, please uh, push uh, tag the person, uh, tag somebody with a Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Now, every Friday is uh, Grayson's Joke of the Week. I do want to say shout out. Um, James McQuiggan has been um, uh, basically subbing in as Grayson has been on sabbatical from the Joke of the Week. So uh, um, James McQuiggan did a super chat earlier, which I think is the Joke of the Week, unless he has texted me. Uh, this just in, I have been texted. This is the uh, joke of the week. Uh, hold on one second. I just let me, ha ha, Nelson. I, I accidentally closed this earlier. Let's get this open. Let's do this and let's do this. All right, everybody. James McQuiggan, joke of the week. Uh, <laughs> oh my God. James McQuiggan wants to tell you he wouldn't buy anything with Velcro at all. It's a, co- it's a complete ripoff. Hey, uh, buyers beware. Velcro, complete ripoff. And also, um, I don't know if you guys heard about the joke about butter. He, he better not tell any of us, though, especially on stream, because we might spread it. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. And finally, um, I don't know if you guys heard the joke about paper. Did you guys hear the joke about the paper? I, I'm not even going to tell it. It's absolutely terrible. Terrible. Oh, my God. <laughs> the fact that I have to read these jokes is is killing me. Here we go. Uh, Leon Ellett with the gifted subs. Thanks, Leon. Just become best friends. Yep. Big topics at Aspen Cyber Summit 2023. The seventh annual summit presented by Aspen Digital took place this past Wednesday at the 92nd Street Y in New York City. It featured a who's who of cybersecurity bigwigs from corporate and government, including Jen Easterly and Chris Krebs. Oh, Jen Easterly! Among the topics discussed, (laughs) CISA and FBI officials painted a grim picture of the ongoing evolution of ransomware. The Department of Homeland Security is using AI to help detect the manufacture of dangerous materials and human trafficking operations. The SEC defended its cybersecurity disclosure rule, brought about in part due to concerns about the underreporting of cybersecurity incidents by public companies. AI is proving to be of significant concern for the 2024 elections. CISA director Eric Goldstein pointed to the Viasat attack on Ukraine last February as an example of how important redundancy and resiliency is for defenders. And NIST director Lori Lacasio stated that quantum safe cryptography is, quote, not going to be cheap, end quote. All right, couple things really quickly. Lyro, Lyrog in this 59 over on Discord. Uh, there is not uh, the story about me and the CISO getting passed over. That has not been ever made public. I'm happy to share it during Jaw Jack. And if you guys want to gather around, there was another thing that I was going to share. Oh, remind me the Black Hills thing uh, that I'll share at Jaw Jacking as well. Uh, also, really quickly, we saw a super chat come in. Uh, Cyber Hamburglar, which I love that name. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Uh, good luck on your Sec Plus exams, Frank, Andrew Lee, and Casually Joseph. Love it, love it, love it. Thank you, Cyber Hamburglar, for the community support and best wishes to Frank and Casually Joseph. I know you guys are both dialed in and ready to straight up crush that exam. So uh, report back to us and uh, we'll absolutely um, play play the appropriate sound effects. Now, as far as this thing goes, uh, slight deep cut, although this is more mainstream than others. I'm talking about a little place called Aspen. Uh, love, love Dumb and Dumber. Uh, listen, the Aspen Cyber Summit, it happens every year. You know, I, I kind of didn't really play it uh, play it up the last couple of years, but this thing has kind of taken on a 
I don't want to call it a who's who's red carpet of cyber, but leading th- le- like thought leaders and people in powerful positions to influence cyber policy and have visibility into macro level cyber um, situations, especially in the United States, go to this thing and they share information. I would, I would say, you know, honestly, I plan on spending, I don't have a lot of time, but I, I hope I'm, after the show's over, I'm going to Google Aspen Cyber Summit 2023 highlights and see if somebody has done the work of curating, uh, you know, key lessons learned uh, and, and from talking like on YouTube, from speaking parts where I can glean uh, some interesting stuff. I love uh, what they're doing here. And to me, it's, it's always nice, guys. You got to remember, here's the deal, okay? Like, you might be like, oh, what's this matter to me? I don't want to listen to a bunch of scuff suits and Jen Easterly, um, you know, jaw about whatever cyber. It doesn't really affect me. Here's the deal. Me and you, le- <laughs> less me, but uh, BSEC and, and Base Case and, and Kimberly and Kayla Sturgeon, Alana, Tim McDonald, Zach Cho, Kyle Gonzalez, guys, we're, we're in the trenches, right? We're, we're there working on the tactical stuff day in day out right we're we're like logging into the um into the email gateway to look at caught fishes we're taking calls we're we're like dealing with patches or talking to IT we're educating end users we are in the tactical day to day thing but if you lose and this is like this is straight up at you know the more you know uh emote uh, squad members if you want to drop that if you lose sight of like, what is the strategy? Where are we going? What is the direction we're walking in? You get stuck in this reactive ad hoc model where you're just constantly like the guy in loss where you're pushing the button every 90 minutes or whatever. Like you, you're not, you're not driving towards something. You're not building a program. You're literally, Oh, I can't, can't spend time trying to like get better at the big picture because I'm too busy turning wrenches and pushing buttons over here. If I don't turn the wrench and push the button, everything's going to go to hell. Sorry, Kennedy. But but my point is something like this is a curated forced, um, I, I don't even want to call it snackable, but this is like a digestible roll up of the thought leaders in our industry talking about strategy, talking about the big picture, talking about what the hell is going on at the macro level. Getting access to this is valuable because it grounds you in why you're doing the tactical things and gives you direction to move forward and build your program, right? When you're talking to the business, when you're talking, when you're talking to vendors, when you're evaluating stuff, when you're making decisions, you can use this information as inputs to weigh why you're leaning this way or that way or why you should spend money on this particular kind of area of control versus this area of control. I'm telling you, if you're just going YOLO and freaking buying whatever, or you're succumbing to like the vendor rep telling you like, like, oh, passive vulnerability scan is all the rage. You got to get in on this, but you don't even have MFA or something like that. Or, you know, that the, you have like remote access open to the internet, like, like the things that are like commonly being attacked, then sweet. Enjoy the passive vulnerability scan and you'll passively see the threat actor move through your network. Awesome, right? So to me, that's the value of this and why you should uh, listen up and spend some time if you got the cycles to digest the key points from this because it is valuable and it is a, in my opinion, yes, it's a bunch of people wearing nice suits and nice dresses and like hobnobbing and drinking fancy drinks and stuff. But, 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 But at the end of the day, to me, this is effectively a community service for practitioners to get insights into where we're going and why, what, like, what the biggest issues are and why we need to protect from them. All right, let's roll. Programmers leaving authentication creds in publicly accessible software code. Security researcher Tom Forbes and the GitGuardian team found almost 4,000 secrets hidden inside 450,000 projects submitted to the Python repository PyPy. And many of these secrets have already been leaked. Although 4,000 is less than 1% of these projects, the report points out that these secrets become included in multiple releases. The secrets included Azure Active Directory API keys, GitHub OAuth app keys, database credentials for providers such as MongoDB, MySQL, and PostgreSQL, Dropbox keys, and much more. A link to the GitGuardian report is available in the show notes to this episode.
All right. So a couple things here. One, does anyone know this guy, Tom Forbes? I don't know if he's like a creator or this was just like, he just happened to be the guy who did the video for Python or for security rage or whatever. It's kind of hard to see that thumbnail security repo only 329 subscribers. Let's check this guy's channel out dude. early adopter. Uh, let's look at this guy. He's got haddocks in here. All right. You know what? I'm in. Let's go. All right. So check it out. Um, Pi Pi is so if you use Python, okay. There, every time I go to tell you something, like we have to back up so I can explain something else. Listen, anyone who does software development, unless you're like extremely hardcore, leverages existing packages, right? Like if you look at any of my code, and I'm a complete hack when it comes to code. Like it's like import this, import this, import this, import this, function call, function call, function call, and then like a million print debugs. Right? <laughs> but and but anyways, um, leveraging existing packages is how people code because why reinvent the wheel if there's already a wheel that you can just import and then start rolling, right? So PyPy is one of those uh, repos where you can do it. Now this guy Tom Tom Forbes. Um, he basically wrote some type of Python thing that scanned the PyPy packages and found credentials in them. Guys, um, threat actors, not threat actors, but developers who don't know any better, developers who make bad choices will hard code API keys, hard code credentials uh, into their Python packages or into their code. It doesn't have to be Python. And yes, it works, but then other people, especially if it's it's public facing, it's like in a PyPy package or a GitHub package or whatever, threat actors can pull the pull that information down. And guess what? An API key, it's like basically like a secret password, right? Like you go to the you go to the um like the speakeasy bar and you're like knock knock and the little thing slides and they're like, what's the password? And you're like, New England clam chowder. And they're like, is it the red or the white? And you're like, ah, right? But the point is. The, the, the passcode, New England clam chowder in this case, that's the same thing as an API key, except instead of a person sliding that, it's a piece of software sliding it and saying, do you have the API key? What is the password? And when you put the freaking API key into a publicly downloadable repo, guess what? It, it, it's not even, there's no security there anymore because anyone can pull it and walk right through. You might as well take the door off the hinges and just provide a freaking, um, you know, like the beads, like you're in college, you just walk through and be like, oh, yeah, look at the, look at this funky, groovy music going on in here. So it's a bad practice. Threat actors can find it, but this guy doing a community service, nice job, Tom Forbes, uh, found all of them. And I don't know if he notified these people, but here's the deal. Whether you're developing code or you've got some R and D people who are super innovative and they're like the skunk works group in your uh, business, you need to tell them there's two things you should be doing here. One, tell them about this as an example of why you don't hard code freaking keys into software. And two, I would recommend it. You know, I would do this first while you still have their uh, good good graces. Ask them what what software repos are they developing? You'd like to check them out, right? Oh, I'd love to see your code. Like, love to see what's up. And then go check them out and see if there's API keys in there. And then if you find them, definitely tell them and tell them to fix it. If you don't, and, and reissue API keys, by the way, you have to get new ones. You have to revoke any that get compromised. And then two, tell them about this. Tell them about, you know, not freaking hard coding keys. Okay. Best practice. Don't do it. That's what's up. Okay. Alibaba scraps cloud business spinoff blaming U.S. chip export ban. Following up on a story we have been following all year, the troubled cloud spinoff for Alibaba has now been scrapped. The company says this is due to, quote, uncertainties created by U.S. export curbs on chips used in artificial intelligence applications, end quote. In place of the spinoff, the cloud unit will focus on growing the cloud business and will continue to maintain its independent operation within Alibaba. All right. So a couple things here. One, Alibaba is basically like Amazon in China. They scrapped the cloud business, which is stunning, by the way. Um, Because think of like AWS. Think about how much money AWS makes. Like they basically print money. And Alibaba is Amazon in China. And they were trying to spin up this AWS thing. And they're scrapping it. 
So, dude, when we when they say scrapping it, Great cash, homie. that's an ass load. Sorry, Kennedy. That's an A load of money that they are just saying, like, it's too much. Now, they're citing U.S. chip export ban. I've, I've mentioned this a million times on the channel. I'll mention it a million and one. If you go look at um, the way the United States has been kind of like um, moving pieces around the, the global chessboard around access to technology, access to uh, semiconductor technology, China has lots of factories and they can manufacture stuff, but they don't have some of the raw you know, IP to, to make semiconductors. And the United States has been tightening their grip on exporting that technology to China. They've also paired with large manufacturers like Japan and Netherlands. Obviously, Taiwan's not wicked interested in sharing with them since China thinks Taiwan is um, doesn't exist and that it's a state of China. So this has all been part of like the noose tightening around um, controlling that semiconductor technology. I would say this. I, one thing that I find wild, okay, and if anybody, again, I'm... I'm not a geopolitical expert. I actually wish Finfrock was here because he knows more about China. But um, I find it wild that they came out and said it was because of U.S. chip export banning, right? I mean, th like to me, this indicates that China is admitting that this kind of like stranglehold the United States has been doing over the last two, three years has worked successfully at constraining innovation and preventing technological advances for China. So that is really interesting. Mono Julian with the super chat. Did we just become best friends? Yep. What AI dictator reader are you using? Uh, so I think what you're asking, Mono, I'm not um, I'm not using AI to read the stories. There is a, um, there's a website, uh, is a podcast called CISO Series here. Um, they release a daily podcast every day called Headlines. I am... Uh, friends with the people behind CISO series. I've uh, talked to them. They know about the way we do the show. The podcast is a six minute podcast and I extrapolate it to one hour. So that's what's up with that mono. That's how the, the show uh, works. All right. So anyways, um, this doesn't really affect a lot of us. For me, this story is more interesting from a geopolitical level. Bruh, zero day exploited against government emails. The threat analysis group at Google has revealed that a Zimbra collaboration suite zero day tracked as CVE 2023-37580 and noticed first in July and fixed on July 25th did see exploitations in the wild. The attacks were aimed at government organizations in Greece, Moldova, Tunisia and Pakistan and focused on emails, attachments and webmail credentials. Remembered. All right. So really quickly, Rex Cognito is uh, coming off the top rope at uh, uh, or or um, I, maybe let, let's not make it adversarial. Let's make it um, like a tag team, WWF tag team. Rex Cognitos gets tagged in. He's on the he's in the corner on the ropes, banging the, the ropes up and down. James McQuiggan tags him in. He jumps in. He throws a couple haymakers, haymakers, and then drops the uh, joke. Another joke of the week. Uh, Rex Cognitos, my computer stopped putting out audio for no reason. Turns out it was because it just got sound bored. <laughs> Thanks for the super chat. Did we just become best friends? Yep. All right. So Zimbra zero day exploited guys. Here's the deal. I don't know anyone that uses Zimbra. Doesn't matter. This story came out. I, at the time I said, ah, oh, you got to patch it. Right. And I know you can't patch all the things, but you either have to, here's the thing. Here's the deal. If you can't pat, okay, really? If you can't patch it, because I understand you can't patch all the things. If you can't patch it, that doesn't mean that you just throw your hands up and be like, well, I guess we're just, let's, let's move on to the next thing. You have to take accountability. You have to do something with it. You can't just be like, ah, ah, you know, like either take it off the internet, patch it, come up with a plan, accept the risk for how long until you can upgrade it? How long until you can find another solution? How long until whatever? Because here's the deal. You have the temporal score, getting back to CVSS, that temporal score. You have a window until it starts getting exploited and then you start getting pwned. And like John Wooden said, if you don't have time, John Wooden, the UCLA coach from the 60s, if you don't have time to do it right now, then when are you going to have time to do it again? Right? So if you do some half a, 
um, solution or do nothing, you're you're like, what are you doing? Right? You, listen, here's the deal. You got a nail in your tire, right? You got a slow leak. I don't have time to fix this tire. I don't have time to replace the tire. I don't have time to put air in the tire. All right friggin' chuckles, roll on it. So you drive around town all day, every day. Guess what? At some point, you're going to come out of the deli and you're going to have a flat tire and good luck driving home on a rim. You cannot delay. I'm sorry, guys. The freaking job, cybersecurity, it's not easy. It's constant and it's it's long. And and for something like this, you have to work with your IT counterparts to get it sorted out. And if they don't want to do anything, well, then you got to run it up the chain as a real risk. Listen, Maybe you don't run every vulnerability up the chain because then you would look like Chicken Little and people would be like, oh my God, here's Jerry, another vulnerability. Oh my God. But now it's being actively exploited. So now you got two things you got to do. One, you got to look for indicators of compromise in your own environment because now we have evidence it's being exploited. And then two, you need now you run it up the chain and say, listen, we have our ass. Sorry, Kennedy. It is Friday. I don't know what's going on. I spent too much time with Finfrock yesterday and I'm all loose. Listen, we've got our hospital gown completely open and our butt is hanging out. What do you want to do? This needs to be remedy. We either take it off, we patch it, we find a solution, we upgrade. I don't give a damn what we do, but what we don't do is nothing. What we don't do is stick our head in the sand and pretend this isn't happening, you jackal. Like, what do you think? What do you think? Like, are you gonna are you gonna hire a, a barricade cyber to come in after we get compromised? Is that the plan? Are you putting money aside to handle the freaking professional services we're gonna have to deal with? The PR nightmare we're gonna have to deal with? Is that what the plan is? Are you interested in spending more money in a month than spending no money right now or minimal money on a, an upgrade? Maybe you don't take that approach in that tone, but my point is. A penny today is worth a dollar tomorrow if you're dealing with risk exposure. I, I don't know why businesses don't get this. I get it. Here's the deal. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Now I'm losing it. Listen, here's the deal. Like, yeah, I get it. When we do our job right as cybersecurity professionals and we take X amount of money, it's very difficult to demonstrate the value, the return on the investment to the business because the better we do our job, the less it looks like we're doing. The better I am at my job, the more boring the business is. And guess what? That is an indicator of quality. That's an indicator, that's a metric for the efficacy of what we're doing here. We had zero incidents this month. You're welcome. Now get out of my way. Instead, they're like, we had zero incidents. Why should we invest in this? We're spending money and nothing's happening, Jerry. I think that you're just bloat. And it's like, try me, bro. Like, stop investing. See what happens. Like, F around and find out. Like, look at the metric, dude. And 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 it's only when they get exposed, it's only when they run backwards through a cornfield with no pants on, do they realize, oh, geez, we probably should have listened to that guy. Oh, we probably should have patched it. Oh, you gotta patch it. So, so like, it just, it's infuriating the uphill freaking into the wind battle that we have demonstrating the value of investment in cybersecurity because the better we do, the less it looks like we're doing. <sighs> Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Fancy. All right, let's go. Join us later today for Super... All right, guys, if you were here just for the news, we are right at 9 a.m., so shout out to Nick Barker, who always keeps me on track. Guys, next week, if you were here just for the news, before you roll out, I want to say... Next Wednesday, August 20, uh, next Wednesday, November 22nd, the day before Thanksgiving, we are doing our 500th episode. <gasps> Guys, we're going to have massive giveaways for Team Live. If you're Team Replay, please try to make it for Team Live. I want you to have all the opportunities too. We are going to try to get over 500 active live uh, viewers on the stream for 500th episode. We are going to rip the lid off this episode. It's going to be super sick. It's a Wednesday, so I have jaw jacking. It's the day before a long weekend, the day before the holiday for many Americans. Guys, it's going to be so, so sick. Tell a friend, bring your family, log in from multiple devices. Let's go. All right, guys, if you were here just for the news, I want to thank you so very much. Have a wonderful day. Get after it. Straight crush it, homie. Thanks for being part of the community. Thanks for helping each other out. And uh, until next time, stay secure. Now, if you would like, I'm about to 
uh, flip this baby into uh, jaw jacking. So give me a hot minute. And I know Marcus Kyler doesn't like this transition, but I have to do it for copyright purposes until I get it straightened out. See you guys in a minute for hanging out. All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Jaw Jack, and I'm your host, Gerald Osher, straight up crushing it on a Friday afternoon. For those college kids who are just waking up with sleep in their eyes, um, shout out to you. Welcome to the stream. No judgment. No judgment. Let's get some stream beats going. All right, guys. Let me know, especially mods, if you can. I, I'm trying to get the music subtly in the background, but also not over my voice. So let me know if that's good. Um, all right. Yeah. 415, 430 on the regular guys. We've got great numbers. The community is awesome. I hope you're all getting, I really, I genuinely, um, hope that you are getting value, not just from me and the stream, but from being a part of the simply cyber community, whether it's simply CyberCon, whether it's the network connections you're making yourself, whether it's resources and discord, wh whatever it is, I like, it, it's important to me that you're getting value from being a member of the Simply Cyber community. So if you're not getting value, uh, let me know and, and maybe we can help figure it out. Uh, but if you are, then mission accomplished. And that's what we're doing. And that's what we're going to continue doing. Will there be a Turkey Day show? No. Okay, so Space Tacos, great question. We will not do a show on Thanksgiving, um, Thursday, the 23rd of November. We will do a show on Friday, November 24th. It will be remote. I'm going to a family member's for Thanksgiving. And uh, I did it last year. It's going to be super janky. Um, I actually have better gear this year. Uh, but still, it, it'll, be a little, it'll be a little janky. But you know what? It'll be a Simply Cyber production. So um, we will not have a show on Thursday next week. I will remind everybody on the 500th episode on Wednesday. And Friday, we will have an episode. So thank you for that question. Legrat wants the CISO uh, story where I got passed over. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, so check it out. Um, a couple years ago, um, I was working at a rather very large multi-billion dollar institution. The existing CISO um, was managing up. Okay more interested in uh, perspective uh, or, or how how he was being perceived by executives, much more of a Game of Thrones power player, less interested in um, the, the, the operational aspects of the information security office, which he basically unofficially delegated to me. <laughs> okay, so I was doing a lot of, you know, kind of CISO operational work and he, he quit, right? So he quit and there was a, uh, there was a gap and, uh, they put an interim CISO in who was, who was not me, but that's fine. I applied to the job. I felt very confident that since I had basically, uh, had all the relationships, knew the program in and out, had the support of the information security office, uh, workforce, uh, went ahead and applied. Now they, uh, they did, you know, world search or whatever nationwide search. They found a bunch of people. Uh, they, they ended up selecting five people and, uh, I went through like the, or no, no, they had like 25 people and you had to do like a video submission thing or whatever. So I, I did that and uh, made it, I made it to the next round and then I got pulled aside. I got, I got pulled aside and I was told, Hey, you know, the other candidates are really strong. And, and this part is going to make you want to throw up in your mouth. Okay. I've actually never told this story, um, publicly. Okay. So they said, Hey, listen, um, you know, like, because, because I was a candidate, I was not allowed to evaluate the other candidates, right? Like, you know, obviously it makes sense, right? It, had I, so, so I don't know who the other candidates are, but they're like, listen, the other candidates are very strong, very strong. And, uh, you know, we really think, um, that, you know, you could continue through the process, but I think, okay, this is the, the person talking to me. Okay. I don't want to name them, but they're like, I I've interviewed all of them. And I think that you will not get the job. Okay. So because of that, you know, I don't know if you want to continue going through the process, but I have high confidence. You will not get the job. 
And I said, all right, you know, that's uh, that's a tough pill to swallow, but okay. I can, I can, you know, I'm, I'm a professional, like I'll own that. All right. I said, do I need to like rescind my application officially? And they said, no, 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 no. It's uh, it's fine. We'll take care of it. Like it was already rescinded basically. And I said, all right, the very next thing out of this person's mouth, I'm, this is the same phone call. Okay. The very next thing out of their mouth was, well, now that you're not a candidate anymore, we need your expertise to evaluate the candidates to tell us which one's the best one. Okay. This is one of those decision points where if I was <laughs> maybe Charles Finfrock, I would have told them what they could do uh, with those candidates and then gone and quit then. But instead, because I'm a professional, and it makes my skin crawl just saying it, uh, but in the moment, because I'm a professional, I said, all right. And I I joined the committee as the subject matter expert because the committee is composed of people who are not InfoSec practitioners. They needed me because I know how to be a CISO and I understand the program to evaluate the, the candidates. And I evaluated them and good people, fine, fine. But I'm telling you, in an unbiased, objective way, I was a better candidate than like to, to say that I was like far and away not going to make get the job was a complete fabrication. I evaluated these people. No. OK, so we end up narrowing it down to two individuals. They offer it to one. No, no, no. they go to offer it to one and that one um, drops out. And they're like, oh, so now there's one candidate. Guess which one got the offer? Okay, they gave the offer. And uh, I mean, there is a little bit of poetic justice coming up in a second. They gave the offer. Uh, the individual accepts the offer. The individual is scheduled to start like six weeks later on a Monday. On the Sunday before, so this is like, like been issued a machine, been given creds, everything. On the Monday before, the person sends an email and says they quit. So, um, <laughs> and uh, I, I had already, I had already resigned. I had already announced my resignment. I said, I'm out. And they're like, hey, um, Jerry, buddy, pal, this dude um, has changed his mind. Hmm? I was like, no, I'm out. Like, nope, nope, nope. Catch me outside. How about that? So that's the story of uh, the CISO. Guys, I was so confident that I had this job. I, I would have gone through the whole process. I would have done great work, okay? I, that I bought a suit. I started making video content. And I was going to produce an entire video series on me getting this job. I, I did a video on my resume, on how I shaped it on that video interview thing I did and how I pr produced it. I was going to cover the job interview, offer letter negotiation. I had the entire video series of me getting this job. And, you know, and then obviously I, I shelved it. I put it into the Disney vault. So, um, yeah, so that's the CISO stories. I wasn't looking at chat as it came through, but I don't know if you guys have any, have any thoughts on that. Look, I'm just looking at mod chat. Mod chat's really good at curating the content here. Yeah, exactly. Um, so a lot of people, I'm seeing people who this story resonates with you. Um, yeah, being asked, being asked to, um, being asked to have like to go for a job, told you can't get it, and then told that they need you because you can do the job to evaluate the candidates to see who can do the job. It's just a bridge too far, man. It's just a bridge too far for me. And everybody that I, I, you know, I loved the people I was working with and uh, all of them completely understood. Actually, a lot of them thought, um, you know, like, good for you, Jerry. Like, that's absolutely um, what's up. All right. So, hey, let me share this one. What's your opinion on a playbook that isolates servers if a high alert is detective? I, I love it, dreaded hoser. Yeah, I think it's good. Um, you got to make sure. Here's the thing. If you're going to run an automation that isolates a server, uh, if a high alert is detected, you should do that, but at the same time, what's your like? Do you are you doing DevOps where you can spin up another instance of the server really quickly and, and move network traffic over there? If it's a critical business application, have you talked to the business and gotten them on board 
with the workflow. Like, yes, tactically, you can shut it down and in quarantine and all that other stuff. But is the business prepared to know that that's what's happening? Have you talked to help desk or support desk um, to know? Because the calls are going to start flowing in and they're going to want to know what the hell is going on. So if you're going to write that automation, yeah, wicked cool. Technical stuff is all the rage. Engineering's wicked fun. But you do have to bring the business in on what that looks like. What are the criteria for doing it? When it does happen, what's the communication plan? It, it, it's a much bigger process than just a cool playbook that you hit a button and roll on. All right, so the email story, Tom Bishop says, okay, guys, now they didn't say I shouldn't say this, but um, I don't know if you guys know, um, hold on, let me, let me do this. I don't know if you guys know, but like, check this out. The Spearfish General Store over at Black Hills, right? By the way, I just bought this shirt. Where is it? They have a brand new red team shirt. I literally just bought this. Um, it should be here like tomorrow. Okay. Uh, I got messaged yesterday by Black Hills and they're like, hey, Jerry, it'd be really cool to do a collab with Black Hills and, and Simply, Simply Cyber for something in the, in the general, in the Spearfish general store. Any ideas? And I was like, super uncool. Like I was like, really, I should have been cool and been like, yeah, that sounds good. Let's talk. Instead. I was like, Oh my God. Oh my God. Like emotes, like sent the email, then thought about three other things. I'm like, Oh, like uh, one idea. I would love to do a GRC backdoors and breaches expansion pack. Um, I would love to do like a cool shirt collab thing. If anyone has any thoughts, but black Hills wants to do a collab with, with simply cyber and uh, I'm freaking loving it, dude. I'm loving it. Uh, I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know when it's going to be. But just know that um, two thumbs and all smiles is wicked excited. This guy. All right. So check it out. That's that's what's up with that. I'm super pumped. I am. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's so cool. All right. What, how's everybody else doing, guys? I got to Fridays are the best. Am I right? Like, Fridays are so cool. We had Finn Frock yesterday. Uh, live studio uh, was going on. This um, neon sign you guys see in the background, um, Mrs. Osier got that for me for Christmas last year. I haven't had a place to put it, but now the Buffer Osier Flow Studio is a place to put it. Emmanuel dropping a super chat. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Thank you, Emmanuel. Dr. Osier, you're a better man than me. I would have said, how about y'all drink a nice tall of Drano? <laughs> a nice tall glass of Drano after being passed over and asked to help. I know. I know. I'm just, it's just how I am, Emmanuel. I, I, I feel you. Here's the thing. I felt like saying that, but I just, I don't know what to say, man. It's just, it's just, it's, it's just ingrained in my DNA. So... All right. Oh, it looks like uh, some people are buying the Thing Anti-Siphon shirt, you guys. Um, this one just came out uh, right here. This one just came out. The Thing Anti-Siphon shirt. Very cool. I got to tell you guys, if you don't own a Black Hills Information Security shirt, I'll just tell you, like the quality of the material is like really nice. It's like, it's like soft and it's like a really nice shirt. Um, so there's that. I would get this long sleeve shirt. I, I love the Black Hills uh, long sleeve. The problem is I live in the South and it's like hot, humid and sticky 364 days a year. So like owning a long sleeve shirt is a fun idea. But in practice, it's it's uh, it's not a good idea, y'all. Have a good weekend, not only IT. All right. So uh, I got 15 more minutes. Guys, if you want to talk about anything, if you want to do ask me anything, I'm happy to do that. If you guys just want to chill, um, I'm happy to do that. George Strasberger is rocking the Threat Actor Suck shirt. Nice, George. Oh, hey, I got a, I got a poll question or whatever. Uh, guys, drop it in chat. Um, I'm like almost positive. Like I'm 99% I'm sure I would just need to validate it. I'm 99% sure that we have it, definitely one emote unlock available, possibly two emotes. So what kind of emotes would you got, Would squad members like to see? We've got um, a lot going on. Cash rules everything around me. Hacker man, the more you know. 
Yeet, I Heart Nist, John Strand. There's a million there. If you're a squad member, you know what's up. Um, I want to add some more uh, emotes to the squad membership, but I, you know, I would like it to be emotes that you guys want. Yeah, I, I love TCM too. Heath is great. Zach's great. Joe Hudson is great. They have a great team over there. Rick Flair, Luke Canfield. <laughs> Uh, Mono Julian, showing your worth is leaving when you're not appreciated and standing on it or ask for three times more for them, not getting the first offer. Exactly, Mono. Well, the thing is, like, even if they paid me more, I actually said that to them because because that was actually part of the discussion, Mono. Uh, thanks for the super chat. Did we just become best friends? Yep. That was part of the um, the conversation. They said, you know, what what will it take for you to take the job? Like, what name your number. And I said, it's not about money. Like, it's, it's not about money anymore. Like, like. Basically, you burned the bridge, I guess is the best way to put it. You burned the bridge. You torched, you torched the bridge when you asked me, when you, when you basically told me I wasn't going to get it, then asked me to evaluate the candidates. And to add insult to injury, I, I honestly thought objectively that I was a stronger candidate than the pool of candidates. So it wasn't like, you know, I, I felt like the statement itself was not true. And it was just in a convenient it was a convenient explanation to get me to make the decision to, to, to rescind my application in the first place. All right, here we go. We got some um, whack-a-mole emojis coming in. Ric Flair emotes coming in. Um, can you name a good asset management tool? Uh, Pamela Joshua says. Um, it depends what kind of assets, Pamela, right? So hardware, software, data. Um you know, I know I've seen, I want to say Avanti is decent. I, 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 I don't know. I haven't had a lot of success with asset management solutions. Let's check it out. Uh, I mean, it depends how big your organization is too. Look, let's see what Gartner says. See, like these Gartner examples are probably for large enterprises versus small ones. I haven't never heard of any of these. I, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, uh, un unfortunately I don't have a great asset management, uh, answer Pamela, Joshua, Excel, <laughs> you know, which, which is difficult to manage and, and maintain. Um, and I'm being slightly, uh, playful. Um, all right. All right. Lane Hubble says after you kill an interview and get the dreaded rejection in the email, what's the best way to get feedback from the recruiter interviewer? Getting feedback is really difficult, Lane, uh, only because anything they say, um, think about it. If I'm like, oh, um, like great interview, Lane, but we didn't like, we didn't like the way you answered this question. It, 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 it invites, and maybe you wouldn't do it, Lane, but it invites uh, people to respond back and say, well, that's not what I meant, or you misunderstood me, or I disagree with you. It, it invites like a continuation and, and unfortunately, the people trying to interview you um, aren't necessarily wanting to continue the conversation, right? So uh, a lot of times, it frankly, it's just easier not to reply. Now, what I would say is if you have uh, some type of relationship, uh, networked relationship or anything with somebody in the interview room, you can get feedback on that. Um, you know, I, I guess, you know, what I would say is... Um, you have one chance. This isn't like Eminem and eight mile, but like one opportunity you have is to reply. Um, sometimes the rejection letter comes from HR. So you need to reply. Maybe here, here's the deal. I would, if it were me, I would not reply to more than one person. Right. So you can reply, like say Lane Hubble, Billy DP and CJ interview me for the job and I, and I don't get it. And I want feedback. I would independently email CG, independently email Lane, independently email Billy DP and just say, hey, I just wanted to let you know, as you probably already know, uh, you guys went with a different candidate. Totally cool. I hope, I hope, um, you know, I hope it's a good fit for your organization. I enjoyed, um, I enjoyed talking with you. If you have any feedback or, you know, tips uh, on how I might be able to interview better, I'd be interested in that. Thanks so much. And, uh, I'll see you, you know, I'll see you at the next one or whatever. Right. So like 
don't, if you're going to send the email, send it to one person. So they feel less of a social pressure to not respond because other people are on it. Second of all, acknowledge the fact that you're not upset about not getting the job, like, like call it out. And then third, cause that'll set the person who's receiving the email at ease, that you're not adversarial, that you're not angry, that you're not vindictive about not getting the job. So it sets their mindset. And then optionally ask them if they would like to provide feedback. Don't ask them directly for feedback, you know, make it, make it a choice that they can make. I think if you use those techniques, you could get some feedback that's useful. Opinions on Coursera courses, Mr. Green asks. Um, uh, Coursera is fine. I, I did a video with, uh, I think the Google cyber cert on Coursera. Um, I believe Coursera is like you and someone fact check me. Coursera is like you to me or the, or Cyberary where different content creators can produce the content. So it's very difficult to say Coursera is great because you could have crap content and you could have amazing content on the same platform. So you got to do your due diligence to figure out what's good and what's not. All right. Keeping on the channels here. Uh, no moniker says there's YouTube channels and discords where you can do mock interviews. Absolutely. I have a video for that, um, where you can use chat GPT to interview you for a job and then give you critical feedback. That's a really great tip. Um, go look on my channel for chat GPT job interviews. You can literally tell chat GPT to be an interviewer, ask you questions, for, copy and paste the job rec, put it in chat GPT, ask it to ask you questions. Then you type in your response or hit the microphone and speak your response as if you're in an interview and then ask chat GPT to evaluate your response and give you feedback. That's a super power tip. All right. Yeah. Emmanuel dark says it could open a lawsuit. That's what I was saying before. Um, uh, let's see what else. Um, BSEC weighs in on asset management. Uh, many help desk softwares have asset management. Yep. Um, oh, divine dream, divine. You're so, you're so nice. Thank you. Divine dream, divine. Um, where's my toasty? Um, uh, I'm reading, I'm reading chat right now to see if I can find questions for y'all. Uh, mod chats here really quickly. Um, Elite gunslinger for non-critical incidents. Do you think it's all right to perform light incident response for lesser high volume interactions, such as users exfilling data that isn't critical? For non-critical incidents, do you think it's all right to perform light IR for lesser high volume interactions? Uh, yeah, I mean, so elite gunslinger, here's the deal. If you have the cycles, then yeah, you should. Because if people are doing data exfil and it's against policy, um, you need to like basically get that corrected and put in, put policy in place. If it's already in place, then educate end users. Um, if you're educating end users and they're still doing it, then you need one of two things, either educate management that it's happening and have them handle it. Right. You can't, you can't sanction or punish an end user, right. Their management needs to do it. And this is part of like the business and infosec, um, not really fighting, but like collaborating and working together. And then if, they're exfilling against policy and management still doesn't push it. Well, then you, you should propose, and this is kind of a dick, dick, kind of a peckerhead move, but like propose that you change the policy from not allowing data exfil to allowing data exfil, get it up to the CIO's desk. And when they're like, why are you changing the policy? Be like, well, we're, we are doing it here and the business accepts it um, and isn't changing it. So we should document it as the policy. That way, when we get audited for compliance, we're not violating it. Oh, I'm sorry. You don't like that we're just allowing end users to data exfil their heart's delight? I don't know. Maybe you should escalate at CIO, right? Obviously, you do it with a bit more tact, but these are techniques you can use. All right. Um, and thanks, Elite Gunslinger. Have a great weekend, too. Hold on. Uh, okay. Hey, is Kimberly's mom here? Is Kimberly's mom here? Welcome to the party, pal, Miss, Mrs. McKnight, or uh, Kimberly's mom. What GRC classes or certs would you recommend after completing your GRC masterclass? Tim McDonald asks. Tim, for me, for my for my dollar, um, I like ISACA CISA. If you want to get into audit, great, great place to onboard into GRC. Or um, CSUM. If you want to get into GRC management and eventually uh, CISO. So CSUM and CISA, but both through ISACA. 
All right, let's keep going here. What's the best way to network with a manager at a company without seeming as if you are only interested in a job from them? Great question. Um, I mean, CJ, what I would do, there's a couple, I mean, there's a whole bunch of different ways. One, um, give value to them. Like, Hey, like connect to them. Hey, like, you know, Hey, you know, I don't know, like CJ, for example, say you connect to them and say, Hey, we're both in the cybersecurity community. And I love connecting with like-minded professionals. Once you make the connection, maybe you send them a link and say, Hey, I don't know if you know, but you know, I, I join this daily cyber threat briefing every morning. It's a, it's a great way to stay current on the industry. Now, first of all, you're telling them that you are doing this, which is good for you. Second of all, you're sharing a resource, you're delivering value to them, which is really good. Um, and then, you know, maybe, maybe they work in healthcare, maybe they work in industrial control systems, whatever. Um, you might say, Hey, like, um, like a story comes in and says like, Oh, there's been a, you know, whatever breach with this, you know, um, Rockwell automation thing say, Hey, you know, you know, not, not to, I'm sure you're staying on top of this, but this was in this morning's news. And I know that you work in healthcare or energy or whatever, just wanted to put this on your radar in case it affects you. Right? Like deliver value into the network. Right. And if they're ghosting you or whatever, then guess what? Like it's not going to happen. And there's no amount of like that that's going to work, but you know, it is what it is. But what I will tell you, CJ, is by laying those seeds, maybe you connect with them or you run into them at a conference or in chat or whatever. And then you've already established and built the value that you bring. You're not just leg humping them for a job. You know what I'm saying? And, and you should do it for more than just that one manager, right? You should be kind of being very deliberate about the different um, places you're trying to build a network and deliver value and stuff like that. Um, oh, BSEC chimes in CJ and says, you could even say, quote, hey, just wondering how you keep up with your daily cyber stuff. I've been watching this podcast for the last X months. You could check it out if, you, if you're looking for it, right? So then you're actually asking them how they do it, which is engaging the conversation. Two, you're delivering value by telling them how you do it. Three, you're quantifying how long you've been doing it. You didn't just Google some like cyber podcast, copy, paste, send it over, right? Uh, so that's good. All right, uh, continuing on. What are some job titles that one should look for within GRC? Nathan Bolin asks. Okay, um, Nathan Bolin, ready? GRC analyst, risk analyst, compliance analyst, cybersecurity analyst, which is super vague, but it'll fall under there. FISMA auditor, SOC 2 auditor, PCI auditor, although you should have PCI training, COVID auditor, um, HIPAA auditor, FedRAMP auditor. GRC manager, GRC analyst, information security awareness analyst, information security awareness lead. Um, th yeah, I think those are the ones that you want. Also, you could look for privacy analyst. Privacy is a subset um, of information security with, with compliance elements. I, if you're going to go privacy though, it should be not your end goal, unless you love privacy. It should be um, a step on the path to get over into GRC. All right. Luke Canfield, thank you for the uh, opportunity to use the emote, Luke Canfield. Where is it? 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 FedRAMP auditors are so hot right now. Oh, maybe what? Maybe that's the emote. Maybe it's Will Farrow's head here. I don't know, guys. Still looking for emote ideas, but FedRAMP auditors are so hot right now. I actually, I don't know, guys. What do you think? What do you think? Hold on. I'm gonna put a post here. Start the poll. Let me see what people think. Um, how hard is the CISM certification? Uh, this question coming in from either Mod Chat or. Um, or, you know, or repeat. So I have the CISM, I have the CISA. Um, I've let them lapse now, which by the way, like one thing I don't like about ISACA, if you don't pay the fees to maintain the um, cert, they don't just say like expired. They It's like, 
it's like it's a much more aggressive status. It's like uh, revoked or something like that. Like like they took it away from you because you you couldn't handle it. Um, the CISM certification is, I would say it's it's challenging, but like not OSCP challenging. The thing with CISM and CISA, but really CISM is you need to read the ISACA material on the CISM. ISACA is very funny about how they ask their questions. And unfortunately, and I know this is going to sound like a, a jerk thing, the way that they want you to answer it is not necessarily how you would do it in real life. So sometimes you've got to know what ISACA wants you to say versus how you would handle it. Like, for example, there's like, oh, there's a breach. Like, who do you tell first? Like CEO, CIO, legal counsel, or the like, or the press or whatever, or like uh, the board of directors. And it's been a few years, but like, like, I, and again, don't hold me to this. This is just like a fun fake example, but like, they will want you to say CEO or no, no, they'll want you to say like board of directors, but like really the CIO is the first person you're going to call. Like, Hey, like, cause it's, it's like your, usually it's like your direct boss, right. In most organizations, like, Hey, we've got a big problem. Like, and you're almost telling the CIO not to like report it, but because you're going to need resources fast deployed to help you deal with this. And the CIO has got access to it and applications and, 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 and usually owns the, uh, insurance policy. So like you need, you need to engage the CIO because you need them to do their job as quickly as possible to help you do your job as quickly as possible. Right. You're not going to call the freaking board of directors. What are they going to do? Like, uh, like they're going to get in the way, frankly. So <laughs> no, but you got to know what ISAC is going to say. So, um, just that, that's what's up. Okay. It's an in-person exam. You got to go drive to a testing center. You sit down. It's like an SAT test. At least when I took it, it was not, of course, I'm like old and gray. Like it was not a computerized test. I had to do it in a workbook. Um, number two pencil. Ugh. All right, let's keep going. Uh, 57 votes. There's 250 people here. So I'll wait um, until we get at least 50% uh, voting population. But go ahead. If you're on YouTube right now, please vote on the emote. Uh, poll. It's literally at the top there. Just click yes or no. Looking at uh, looking at um, chat. So, I mean, not that this is a question, but CISSP versus CISM. If you are looking like, okay, so if you've been in the industry a long time and you've already got responsibilities, I would argue the CISM is better value for you for career growth and trajectory. If you need five years of experience to get a CISSP, but you're able to get experience in security even as a sysadmin because you're doing infosec stuff or a network engineer doing infosec stuff. So if you're not really in security and you're trying to pivot into full-time security or you're like mid mid career, then CISSP to me is going to add more value because it'll unlock more job opportunities and allow you to pivot where you're going. If you're already kind of a senior person and you're starting to like dabble in management and you're in like meetings about budget and about forecasting and, you know, 2024 planning and sh like that, CISM is more where it's at. Okay. All right. Keeping on, keeping on here. Okay. Let me check my calendar really quickly. All right, I've got a couple more minutes if you guys want an extended jaw jacking. Ah, oh, you got a Patrick. Ah, oh, <laughs> guys, um, I, I would love to ask you a question. Did anyone, um, anybody have any thought? Like, I know some of you attended the Simply Cyber Live with Finfrock last night. We did it here in a live production studio. I know that there were some challenges with the wide lens camera um, zooming in and out. I've actually corrected that already. Um, the lighting was a little janky. What did you guys think about that live video podcast format? Like in general, did you like the idea? Did you like the switching cameras? Did you like the sitting down and talking? Um, any constructive feedback that you have, if you attended last night is appreciated. I am very much interested in serving this community and I want it to be as great a quality product as I can deliver 
with the budget and the resources at my disposal, which, you know, is not, I, I can't, this isn't a Hollywood studio. And I don't have a ton of experience with like AV gear. Although I do have amazing mods like Base Case and BSEC and Jesse who do understand AV gear, uh, who helped me. Thank you guys so very much. So if anyone's got anything in there, let me know. The in-person with Finn Frock was great. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, Nathan Bolin, uh, I'd have to look at your uh, work experience, Nathan, but if you're more a senior practitioner, then yes, CISM is good. If you want to go into management, if you want to be like a hands, uh, hands on the keyboard architect and not deal with humans, then system's not good for you, right? No problem, Mr. Green Reads. Yeah, Finn Frock, thank you, Space Tacos. Uh, Mike Presence, I, you know, I do p podcasts multiple times a day. So like my face is always right on the mic. Uh, if you're not used to doing it, you know, you know, you're like all over the place, you know? So yeah, I agree. Um, a sorry Kennedy emote. Hold on. I'm going to write this down. You know, Kennedy was Estella Reyes's daughter or is. I haven't seen Estella in chat for a while. I don't know if she's still uh, hanging out with the community right now, but Kennedy, Ke sorry, Kennedy, we'll continue on. All right, so sorry, Kennedy. I'm writing this down so I can run a poll. Uh, Will Farrell so hot. Okay, emotes. All right, continuing to look at feedback. CJ says he loved the show, wasn't a fan of the camera switches, felt it drew away from the topic. Made it less of a chat, more of a monologue. Okay. Okay. So the so yeah, Nick Dowd. I did have the Taz cam going. I think it was more about um, the guests' mic presence than it was about um, the the um, the mixing board. But you know what? I I could have I could have uh, pushed the gain up on the mixing board and just allowed uh, Charles to speak further away. Why did the UDB packet go to the doctor, Christopher K. Hall? Because it was feeling a bit lost. <laughs> Great. Oh, Nathan Bullen, two years as an analyst. Um, I would actually go CISSP there. Um, Nathan Bullen. Ah, you got to patch it, emote. Ah, you got to patch it. So, uh, Casually Joseph says, Jerry going nuclear. I mean, we do have the spicy emote. I don't know. I mean, that's always been, if I lose my mind. IDK says, Hey, Dr. Rozier, have you used let's defend? I'm thinking about using that great discount. Yeah. So, I mean, I have used let's defend. You could see right now, uh, if you use my code, simply cyber 50 at let's defend, you'll actually get, um, 50% off. If you're interested in learning blue team. Oh yeah. There's a 50% off uh, deal. So you can use my code or you can use their code. I'd recommend using my code. Uh, I do get an affiliate fee potentially, which would help support the channel, but either way, I don't, you know, use it, my code, their code, it doesn't matter, but they have learning paths. They have courses. It's very much designed for hands-on skill learning for blue team operations. So detection engineering, IR, uh, they got cloud stuff. Um, if you want to learn the hive, uh, the hive is like a ticketing system for, um, incident response alert tuning like so they have more advanced skills as well as entry level skills over here i i think it's a great platform i have used it to like so here's here's something you guys should know um i won't like i won't like endorse or affiliate with a a security vendor unless i do some due diligence on is it legit does it add value are they reputable right i'm not just like Hey, you got to check out NordVPN up in here. Like it's, it's like, is this legit? Are they part of the community? The cool thing about let's defend is that it's a, and I'm a huge fan of this. It's a security company built by security people. So they understand the struggles and the challenges that we deal with and they've built the platform to help. So yes, um, I, you know, I'm all in on, on let's defend. An emote for the mods. There is not an emote for the mods, but mods, should we give you 80 messages in mod chat? Holy Jesus. Um, mods, should we, um, guys, should we do it? What would, what would a mod emote look like? 
Would it be a ha- would it be a band hammer? Would it be Thor coming down with a band hammer? We don't have to do band hammers very often here. What are some websites besides the wonderful community that I can get cyber news from? Lulu Cho asks. Okay, so Lulu, a couple options. Um, I would say so. Sans Internet Stormcast is a popular one. Um, they do a podcast. It's a little bit more technical, Lulu. Uh, but this is, you know, I used to consume this all the time. And then I got more into management and GRC and stuff. So I got away from this a little bit. But there you go. There's, there's an option for you. Go check that out. They're great. They've been doing it for like a million years. I, like, I don't even know how long they've been doing Stan's Internet Stormcast. But it's been around forever. Um, all right. Rihanna's out. Later, Rihanna. Have a good weekend. Oh my God. I totally like was in a hurry yesterday to go get Finfrock and I stopped to, uh, close the, uh, stream. All right. Uh, I let's close this 112 votes. A lot of people like the Will Ferrell so hot right now emote. So we can definitely look into that. Thank you so much for voting guys. Uh, definitely appreciate that. Um, all right. So here we go. Um, you guys see this really quick, the iHeart Nist. We could do iHeart mods or mod love, something mod mod lovish. Oh, hey, really quickly, Lulu. Our own mod, DJ Bsec, actually has a better resource than what I just provided. If Lulu is still here, and this is for everybody, guys. Um, at Lulu, but this is for everybody. This is DJ Bsec, um, who is a mod and a really great guy and a, a battle-hardened practitioner. He actually has a GitHub with all these resources. And you can see um, all he's linked to these resources. He's got, well, these are not linked, but you can Google them. You can Google them easily enough, okay? Let me tell you another one um, that's really worth getting into, okay? This one's not for everybody, but... Um, Check this out. Return on Security by Mike Prevett. This is a newsletter, but he. this is more for people who are more on the CISO track. He breaks down um, a lot of things in the cyber industry, but does it from a like financial and business executive perspective and stuff like that. Glum Hippo always dropping the hilarious... Um, uh, basically web server status codes. Thank you for the super chat. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Uh, so check out, um, uh, Mike's, uh, m- newsletter if you want. I think it's worth, worth your, uh, time. Oh my God. Check this out. What do you guys think of this for the mod, for the mod emote? Huh? Little, a little, uh, 1950s Navy tattoo. Huh? You spent a weekend in port at, uh, Houston's port. You met a you met a you met a mod at a bar named Bsec. Had a couple tequila shots. Woke up with this tattoo. What do you guys think? Let us know in chat. All right. All right, guys. I gotta I gotta get some work done, y'all. I gotta get some work done. Busy day. Got to get some work done. I'll, I'll drop a poll in chat. Uh, we can vote on it. I might even have two emote unlocks so we can really get uh, get into it. I'll probably add this mod emote. I love the Will Ferrell one, but like the mods, guys, you know it. I know it. They know it. The mods, they do a lot of heavy lifting. Their shoulders are probably sore from from <laughs> from me sitting on them. Uh, so I love it. Cool. All right, guys. Be good. Thank you all so very much. You guys are wonderful people. Continue crushing it. Continue supporting each other. Continue helping. Have a good weekend. We'll be back at Monday, 8 a.m. Eastern time. (laughs) Glum Hippo wants a poll on whether or not I should go to work or stay here. LOL. Guys, be good. Thank you all so very much. You guys are amazing. Be good to each other. I'll see you Monday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern time, bright and early for the Simply Cyber 
Daily Cyber Threat Briefing Podcast, episode 498. Tell a friend, episode 500 is on Wednesday the 22nd. I hope you can all make it. Lots of giveaways. Kathy Chambers is in chat, including um, giveaways from ACI Learning. Massive giveaways from ACI Learning. You're not going to want to miss it. Kathy Chambers, a great human, a wonderful professional, and a friend of mine. Hello, Kathy. Have a great Friday. Guys, be well. Until next time, stay secure. Everybody, I hope you enjoyed that content. Keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other Simply Cyber community resources. We have the Discord server that's lively and always keeps the conversation going. You can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. And also every single weekday morning on the Simply Cyber channel, we're doing live daily cyber threat briefings, 8 a.m. Eastern time, as well as Thursday at 4.30 p.m. We're doing live stream interviews with industry experts, and we produce videos that we push out every Wednesday morning. I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber. I hope you enjoyed